afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wally Rada. It's a pleasure to have you here joining me for this leadership series. It's just gone um, five o'clock Singapore local time. Good evening. I'm coming to you live from Singapore, also known as Malayan City. Thank you for joining me today. We will just wait two or three minutes. We've still got like five students joining us every minute in the Zoom channel. So we will start this session at uh, three minutes past five three minutes past five. Whilst I'm here, can I welcome you all? I am very happy to see some regular faces back here. It's good to see you all. It's good to see you again, um, Roslyn. Very good to see you again, Snacy. Hi, Roslyn, how are you? Hello, Raquel, how are you today, Raquel? Good to see you again, ma'am. Hello, Manika. Hi, Manika, how are you today? Good, excellent, thank you. Hello, Clam, how are you? Hello, Jinalyn, how are you? Okay, look at these lovely people. Hello, Lydia, nice to see you again, Lydia. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Janeth. Good afternoon, Catherine. Good afternoon, Denise. Good afternoon, Mildred, nice to see you again. Okay, we will make a start. It seems like we've still got one or two more people coming in. We'll just give them another minute or so. Hello, Spencer. Hi, Spencer, how are you? You need to put on a light, Spencer, I can't see you. Um, okay. Hello, Pugula. Hello, you again. Nice to see you again, you again. Nice hat, you again. Thank you. Ma Mao Chan, welcome back to the session. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, today we're looking at one of the most spoken about um, subjects in today's business world. We're talking about leadership in the 21st century. Oh, you all know that we are now in the midst of the 21st century. We basically are looking at a different world. The world is never going to be the same again. In the last century, we've seen SARS and we've seen COVID-19. And based on current medical evidence, it's likely that version six of COVID-19 might still be in store. The world has evolved. And so does leadership. Leadership continues to evolve with the world. What I want you to do today is imagine that you are a leader of a company or you're looking to become a leader of a company. Even if you work for a company and you're a supervisor or looking to become a supervisor or a manager, you need to learn some of the issues that affect leadership in today's 21st century. So once again, good afternoon, everyone, and I will share my screen and we'll start today's session. Thank you. So what are the challenges facing leaders in the 21st century? Respectfully, being a leader in 1979, 1980 or 1990 is no longer the leader of the 21st century. And there is a difference between being a manager and being a leader. Managers push leaders pull. And I'll explain that as we go through today's session. Um, Mr. Govan, somebody's putting arrows on my slides. There's an orange arrow. Can you stop that person from putting arrows on my slide, please? That orange arrow has suddenly appeared. Please try to stop it. Okay, so let's go on and talk about the challenges. What are the challenges? Well, leadership in the 21st century creates an intersection between the traditional management style and the new style needed in order to sustain any business or business continuity in the 21st century. If you are a manager who has succeeded in the past by telling people and pushing them away simply by threatening them to get something done, that can no longer be effective in the 21st century. Leadership today is at an intersection and that intersection on one side of the road is the old fashioned traditional method of management 
and the new method, which is leadership. Management is where you push, people run. Leadership is where you pull and people follow. Leadership in the 21st century is different to what we used to practice prior to COVID-19. Leaders today face challenges and the challenges are of different dimensions. One is the speed of technological improvement or technological research, computer age, social changes in society, and more importantly, economic change in the economy, not only in your country, but globally. Let's look at what Russia has done in the last two years to the Ukraine. Russia currently has destroyed its own economy whether willingly or unwillingly, the Russian people are now living in poverty. Russian oligarchs have lost all their money and all their wealth, their yachts, their jets, everything due to one man, the current leader of the Soviet Union, Russia. So basically, thanks to one man, for whatever reason he decided to invade the Ukraine, he has caused a economic disruption to not only his country, but the world. He has also disrupted the price of oil for the countries that rely on Russia for electricity and energy. Today, more than ever, we live in a disruptive world, whether it's a war in the Ukraine, COVID-19, whether it was a natural phenomena or a phenomena released by a certain country in the world. All of these are causing disruptions to the world. But the biggest disruption today is that of digital technology. COVID-19 forced people to learn how to work from home using digital technology and forced people to go from being brick and mortar store consumers to being online consumers. Workforces are no longer going to the office every day as they used to. Workforces have been augmented and changed. Organizations with hierarchy have been flattened. Companies all over the world, including Amazon and some of the biggest technology companies in the world, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, have terminated thousands and thousands of staff and they haven't finished yet. More is to come because they finally realized you don't need 50 managers in a company that only has 200 staff. You can run the same company with 20 leaders, no need for 50 managers. So if you're an old fashioned manager, your days are numbered. Today, more than ever, companies are moving from manager push, employees run, to leaders lead, employees follow. It's an ongoing shift to team-based work practices. And what it means is that organizations, businesses, and companies are challenging their leaders to step up and show the way forward, otherwise risk losing the job. Because they finally realized, I don't need 200 managers at Google to make Google profitable. I don't need 1,500 team leaders at Facebook to keep Facebook open. Facebook fired a large number of people recently, but Facebook was never closed down. It can operate without them. And that tells us they weren't actually leaders. They were just keeping an office desk warm and calling themselves managers. So in the 21st century, leadership has changed. Okay, what do I mean by leadership? Let me just confirm that before I change. Leadership is different to just being a manager. And leadership is usually called in most companies, C-suite or C-level of the company hierarchy. You, many companies refer to their leadership as C-suite or C-level. The suite of people who lead the company or the people at the level of leadership. And this term today 
is a common term used. So this is a term you need to become familiar with if you're aiming to apply for a leadership role or a management role in today's 21st century economy. C-suite or C-level refers to the group of top-level management executives who, with their extensive business expertise, administer and manage the organization to ensure its success. So organizations in the 21st century no longer needs a manager to walk in every day and say, you were late. You're late again, I'll fire you. That is the old way of managing people. You push, they run because they fear you. Today, more than ever, management has to go from old day traditional management to today's leadership. And they have to work as C-level leaders. Let's look at C-suite responsibilities. And these are responsibilities which everybody who's a leader should have. They should be able to make decisions. They should be able to set goals they should be able to take responsibility for business administration and management of everyday activity, and they should be able to resolve conflict. So if you have managers working on the factory floor who don't have any of these skills, then the common sense is, is they're not leaders in today's society. Executives are the people, the people that work in the company, but C-suite are the leaders and the senior executives who actually lead those below them to run the business. Leaders need to believe in team building rather than threatening and pushing people away. C-suite positions or leadership positions commonly found in today's 21st century organizational setup are your chief executive officer, your chief operations officer, your chief finance officer, your chief marketing officer, your chief technology officer, and your chief information officer. Let me abbreviate these for you. Please write them down. Your chief executive officer is commonly known as C E. O. Your chief operations officer is commonly known as COO. Your chief finance officer is commonly known as CFO. Your chief marketing officer is CMO. Your chief technology officer is CTO. And your chief information officer is CIO. Now, these are some of the most common C-suite or leadership positions that every company has. Now, if it's an SME and not a company, they would still have a chief executive officer, but he may be called managing director, operations director, finance director, marketing director, technology director, or director of technology and director of information services or information services director. So, these are key positions that are common to every organization in the 21st century. Let me stop the slide now and ask any of you um, about some of these positions. Can somebody tell me what's the difference between a CIO and a CTO? Can anybody tell me what's the difference between a chief information officer and a chief technology officer? Who can answer that question for me? Can anybody raise their hand? Can anybody explain to me the difference? There is a minor difference between CIO and CTO. Who can tell me the difference? Anyone? Okay, well, let me tell you that. Okay, I have um, Amy. Amy Kuchi has raised her hand. Hi, Amy, I need to find you and get you to unmute your microphone. One moment. Hi, Amy, can you unmute your microphone and talk to me? Hi, Amy, go ahead, unmute your microphone. Are you there, Amy? Hello, Amy, would you like to unmute your microphone? 
Are you there? Okay, let's go back and see who else has raised their hand. Okay. okay. Now can you hear me, sir? Hello, Amy. How are you? Where are you from? Hello. Where are you from? Are you there, Amy? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Amy? I'm sorry, I can't hear her, Govan. Maybe you can send her a message. Um, Tin Tin. Hi, Tin Tin. Would you like to unmute your microphone and talk to me? Hello, Tin Tin. Where are you from? Hello, sir. Yes. Where are you from? I'm from, yes, I'm from Myanmar. Tell me, what do you understand the difference between a CIO and a CTO? Yes, uh, I want to, uh, I want to um, share that as I understand in uh, these two, uh, two words, yeah. uh, CTO uh, yeah. and CIO. All right. Well, let me let me tell you the difference. For my understanding, yes. Uh, for yeah. my understanding, go ahead. Your uh, understanding. Yeah. Uh, CTO is uh, it is technic technical. Yes. So people who take responsibility in the technical the chip level, chip level, and then yes. uh, for the CIO is uh for the information who, uh, who can uh, gather the information who can give the um uh, the give and take the information from the from in the, in the uh, high level of the person. So it is a uh, CEO is um, a technical person. Okay, you're on the right uh, definition, Tint. Let me just clarify it for you. A chief information you, officer, a chief information officer is responsible for collection of information, processing information, and providing company employees a mechanism by which to store and process information. You are correct. However, when we go to chief technology officer, he takes on more responsibility. He's not only responsible for the technology they use, he's also responsible for automation. He's also responsible for hardware, mainframe, and all the mainframe technology the company brings in. For example, at um, Amazon, they have a chief information officer, they have a chief technology officer, and they have one more, a chief automation officer. The automation officer looks after robotics and artificial intelligence. The technology officer looks after the hardware and the information officer looks after the information. So you need to become knowledgeable with all the different areas used in the 21st century. So if you work for Amazon Tintin and you worked under the chief automation officer, you would be looking after all the robots in the warehouses and the artificial intelligence that picks goods from the bins and drops them on the packer's desk every 30 seconds. If you work for the chief information officer, you would be collecting information or responsible for collecting information from customers through a customer um, a customer relationship management software or a database. If you were the chief technology officer, you would be responsible for buying all the mainframes, computer desktops and laptops and scanners for the thousands and thousands of staff around the world to use. Does that give you a little bit more information, Tintin? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Are you there, Tintin? Do you understand that? Are you there? I can't hear you. Can you speak to me? Can you understand that, ma'am? Okay. All right. That's okay. Yeah. Do you understand what I said? Correct, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you very I'm much. Also, and the, uh, yes, I'm also, I'm also thinking about well, for the uh, CTO, like the technical, not only a uh, technology. Uh, I, I'm also, um, how to say, I'm also like, um, understand got a, got a point like a technology not only technology for also for technical person okay you chief technical yes. officer in a factory or in a company that has technical 
function, they can also use their chief technical officer to oversee technical processes. Yes, you are correct. But yes. the most Thank common you, you, the most common element for a chief technology officer is different to chief technical officer. Chief technology officer focuses on hardware. Chief technical officer focuses on technical process. So be careful, yes. Tintin, because they're both different positions. If you apply for chief technology officer, it's usually technology hardware related. If you reply, if you apply for a job as chief technical officer, you are responsible for technical process in that organization. I'll give you an example. Singapore Airlines has a chief technical officer that handles all the technical operation of the airline, the types of engines they use on their aircraft, the actual way they run their aircraft technically. But the chief operations officer is responsible for the operation of the airline. Do you understand the difference? Singapore Airlines has yes, a chief yes. technology officer that looks after computer technology. They have a chief technical officer that looks after the aircraft technical requirements. And they have a chief automation officer that looks after the automation of process. So do you understand that as a company grows, the more positions get created? But do you understand the difference between technology and technical? Yes, sir. Yes. Good on you. Thank yes, you sir. so much. I'll talk to you soon, Tim. Thank Tim. You, very, very good question. Thank you. Okay, let's talk to Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Do you want to add to that? Can you answer my question? Is there any other differences between CIO, CTO? Go ahead. Uh, simply put, sir, uh, there are two keywords. For me, CIO, uh, it typically looks inward. Yes. It, it aims to improve processes within the company. While, yes. yes, for CTO, the keyword is outward. It looks outward using technology to improve or innovate products that serves the customer. Victoria, if we were talking about the 19th century or the 20th century, your definition would be ideal. But unfortunately, as we move into the 21st century, the CIO is not only inwards he's also become outwards okay. okay and let me explain why today more than ever information has to flow inwards to the company and outwards from the company in order for the company to maintain its public presence companies now more than ever have to communicate with government organizations and industry partners so a cio is no longer inward only as you said um, it, that used to be the case back yeah, in the 1990s. Ideally, uh, ideally. Ideally. But now, if you, I want to say ideally, ma'am, I'd say traditionally. Traditionally, traditionally yeah. it used to be inwards. Now, yeah, traditionally. But now, ideally, a CEO has to be able to manage inwards and outwards information, not only internal information, but external information which he needs to operate internally or manage the internal operation. So yes, traditionally you were right, but as we move into the 22nd century, CIOs are becoming a lot more external active they, as well. They evolve, sir, through the- uh, Absolutely, company. you're absolutely right. Thank you very yeah. much, very good. Excellent input, thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. Okay, let's go to the next person. I think um, in, if, in Phoenix, Infinix S5, you need to put your real name. Otherwise, you will not be receiving a certificate from us for any of these sessions. You need to show your real name on the screen. My co-host, could you contact Infinix S5 and direct him to show his real name so I can involve him in this class, please? Thank you. Um, Amy, would you like to talk to me now? Would you like to unmute your microphone? Go ahead. Hi, Amy. Hello, sir. Hi. Sorry, Hi. I got lost my connection. Can you share with me what's your idea about the difference between CIO and CTO? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for me, the CIO, which is the information, it is the data for every single day, details of the data, like the information outside and inside about the company, regarding all everything about the company, about the technology, it means this is the one that we use. So this technology, it will evolve our uh, company like, um, like Microsoft. 
we use okay. that the technology mm -hmm. to be evolved. Very our, good. Excellent. Excellent. Business. Let me just draw a distinction there. Chief technology officer is very much specialized in IT technology, computer technology. Chief technical officer, which is different to technology, chief technical officer looks after technical process. Technology officer looks after technology or the infrastructure of the technology. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yes, I do. Okay, I do. good on you. So, do you and you made a very good distinction that traditionally a chief information officer only handled internal information. But now, today in the 21st century, a CIO is responsible for internal and external communication of data. Thank you for pointing that out, Amy. Amy, can I test you? Do you know why a CIO is today responsible for both internal and external data? Do you know what brought that on? Why do you think that happened? I can't hear you, Amy. You're, you're, you're muted. You need to unmute your microphone. Are you there? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, why do you think a chief information officer is now responsible for both inwards and outward data? Why do you think that is the case, internal and external? Yes, because then if the person... It's not the one who knows about outside. Like he doesn't know him, he doesn't know how to evolve because he doesn't know how the information is getting or get out. So you're on the right, yeah, you're on the right track, but let me add to that. It's not only that. The reason that chief information officers traditionally were only looking after internal data and the move in the 21st century for them to become responsible for two-way data, internal and external, is because of data protection laws. You all heard of data protection? So now companies are responsible and can go to jail and be fined if information is leaked or mishandled. Are you all aware of that? Do you understand that, Amy? So now a chief information officer is responsible for protection of that data and the way that data is communicated. And that is one of the major legal, uh, what you call a legal requirements for a CIO today. Now, usually in big organizations like Microsoft and Amazon, they also have a chief data protection officer, and he is the DPO, data protection officer. Usually the data protection officer reports directly to the chief information officer. So the chief information officer will be the head of the information department and the data protection officer will be reporting directly to him because the data protection officer has to make sure that the CIO ensures protection of the data at all times. Do you understand all of that, guys? Do you all understand where I'm coming from? Victoria, do you understand that? Okay. Thank you very much, Amy. I'll talk to you shortly. It's good to see you, Amal. Amal is back. Nice to see you. Hello, Amal. All right. So does everybody understand what I mean by internal and external information? Traditionally, back in the 80s or 90s, a CIO only cared about the information within his company. But in the last century, the importance of protecting customer data has become a big legal issue in all countries. International law has international data protection requirements, which are basically almost the same worldwide. Companies in Singapore, including Singapore's largest phone company, Singtel, has been fined millions of dollars at least three times because its chief information officer wasn't able to manage or protect the information the company collects. So usually now the chief information officer has become much more responsible, not only for the information he collects internally, but for the information that travels to external parties, inwards or outwards. And he usually has a data protection officer reporting him directly to ensure that they adhere to data protection laws and make sure that their information storage meets 
the government requirements in their country. Companies now have to meet certain data storage requirements and security requirements to retain customer information. Could you imagine if somebody hacked into Amazon's database and stole the credit card numbers and the addresses of 200 million customers that Amazon has in its database, what would happen to Amazon? They would lose all their customers because their information was breached. Do you understand that everyone? Do you all understand what I mean by the importance of the chief information officer and his responsibilities now. Can you all wave your hands if you understand for me, please? Thank you very much. Excellent, wonderful. All right, let's let me go back to my presentation, please. Okay, let's talk about other positions of leadership, and there are others. As I said, chief technology officer is there for um technological infrastructure and equipment. However, if we're talking about somebody responsible for technical processes, such as engines on an aircraft or the way ships are built, the technical specs, they would be called the chief technical officer, not chief technology officer. Okay, we have other officers as well. We have chief investment officer, chief supply chain management officer, chief data officer, the chief data officer and the chief information officer are almost the same job. Some companies call them CIO. Some companies call them chief data officer. Amazon has a chief information officer and a chief data officer. And the reason they do that is because they actually control what information the CIO controls and what information the chief data officer controls. Usually the chief data officer is the one that structures how the data is stored. The chief information officer is the one that's responsible for collecting and storing the information based on the instructions of the chief data officer. That is the most common relationship. The chief diversity officer is one responsible for making sure that the company stays up to trend with industry, with consumerism, with consumer requirements, and making sure the company does not fall behind and lose to its competitors. The chief growth officer is usually someone responsible for growing the company and planning its expansion. The chief analytics officer is usually somebody who heads a team of analysts and they are responsible most of the time for reporting to senior management. And chief security officer is one responsible for the security and protection of the company, its staff and its technology. All right, let's go on. Other jobs include the chief legal officer, CLO, chief research officer and chief compliance officer. You don't have to write these down. Um, I will make copy of this presentation available to you. Let's talk about leaders today and their journey to become leaders. Or what do they need to have today in the 21st century to be leaders compared to the traditional manager, which can no longer remain effective in the 21st century? Leaders have to take responsibility and become accountable that is the critical point. But let's start at the beginning of their journey. They are usually an individual. They usually start as a junior executive level or officer level. They learn to work in a team. They then learn to lead a team. Then they start planning, initiating and organizing business activities as they were assigned by management. Eventually, they be given responsibility and they have to accept responsibility and become accountable as managers. But in today, we mean they are leaders because if they take responsibility and become accountable, they have to lead a team. Remember point number four, lead a team. 
Number five, they start planning and being responsible for certain actions or departments, then they take responsibility for it. Once they're able to meet number six, they are considered to be C-suite level or C-level leadership material. All right, remember that in the 21st centuries, chief executive officers are being pressured to take a position on social issues. So CEOs now not only have to run the company, they have to also take accountability for the company's reputation, for the behavior of the people who work for them and the company's public image. You've all heard recently in the news about CEOs that lost their jobs because of their personal lives or CEOs that lost their jobs because they allowed staff to do things which were not legal and the CEO had to accept responsibility. You all remember a few weeks ago, we spoke about CEO's responsibility over comments made by some of his staff, religious comments in France. Some, a CEO of a certain chain in France agreed with one of his staff about Muslims living in France. As a result, that company's image was tarnished the person who made those comments was terminated. So was the CEO who allowed those comments to be made. He took no action. So today, more than ever, a CEO is not the person that sits at the high end of the company. He is responsible for the company and he has to lead the company and be responsible for the actions of everybody in the chain of leadership. Does everybody understand that, ladies and gentlemen? Can you all wave your hands to me if you understand? Excellent. Okay, let me ask you a question. If I ran a company that sold um, jeans or clothes and one of the salespeople commented to a customer that the customer was oversized, fat, obese, and ugly, and the customer complained to my company and I did nothing about it. The customer would then go and blog on social media that we as a company don't like fat people. Do you think that would be negative for my company or positive? Who can give me an answer? What do you think? Um, would it be negative or positive? Who can give me an answer? Who's the first hand that went up? Um, okay, I've got two. Let's start with Raquel. Hi, Raquel. Do you think that would be negative or positive for my company? Go ahead, Raquel. Hello, good afternoon, good good afternoon sir. Hi, Raquel. Nice to see you again. Hi. So if you are okay. the CEO of this fashion retail and one of your staff said to a customer that they're overweight and you don't cater for that sort of customer and the customer, you found out about the complaint and did nothing about it and the company the customer took to social media. Do you think that would be positive or negative for your company? If it, it will be a really very negative impact to your company. Okay. First, like what you said, if he or she is a social blogger or, uh, you know, he is really good in the social media, definitely it will spread all over the world. Definitely. So what, what, do, what would happen to your, uh, to your company? It will the, com the company would fail, right? Absolutely. Just, so just you, like, just, just like, sorry, sir. Just like yeah. if you are a walk-in customer, and yeah. if I am not a social media influencer, I will tell um, approximately ten people or ten, uh, ten, ten sorry. friends that I I have that don't um, don't come to the shop, uh, don't um, don't buy to to any of this kind of brand. It will be really uh, affect your company. Absolutely, Raquel. So do you understand the responsibility of the CEO, not only for crunching numbers, but also for protecting company image? Do you understand the yeah. difference between a manager and a leader today? A leader is all rounded compared to the traditional manager of the 90s. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Y yes, sir. Thank you very much, Raquel. Very good answer. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for explaining you. that so clearly. Thank you, ma'am. 
Okay, can anybody else add to that? Imad. Hello, Imad. Nice to see you back, my good friend. Unmute your microphone. Go ahead. Hi, Imad. How are you? Are you fine? Good, Imad. Can, yeah, you, give me, can you give me another example yeah, yeah. I, of how I, that would yeah. affect the company? It's negative uh, because it's not good uh, image for company. Company right, should uh, be fine. It's so, not uh, better for uh, products and not good results. Okay. Imad, let me ask you, if your CEO allowed the staff to make that comment and did nothing about it, and the company lost business, would that impact yes. everybody who works for the company? Yes, I, it's, uh, of course, uh, there's a very negative result. Thank you very much, Imad. I'll talk to you again shortly. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you for you. your Thank input. You. Okay, let's go on. So, ladies and gentlemen, you see that in the 21st century, the way an organization functions is interconnected. It's like a social network. You all know that today, more than ever, social media plays a very big role in everybody's life. If I ask some of you people here, um, like Lydia, like Clam, like Nazi, like Shui A, they are on social media every day. I'm sure Shui A goes to social media every single day. Social media is not only a personal form of relaxation. Social media has become a part of every male and female child, boy or girl's life in the 21st century. You know that your kids, when they go to secondary school, they are already well aware how to use an iPad or laptop or a mobile phone. My God, when I was at school, I only got my first Nokia mobile phone when I was 15 years old. Lydia, my daughter is six years old in Singapore, and she already knows how to use an iPhone. By the time she's 15, she will know more about an iPhone than any other kid at her age 20 years ago in the 19th century or 100 years ago, because today more than ever, the 21st century has evolved not only the way we work together, but has evolved technology and the way we lead people. Does everybody understand that? Yes or no? Fantastic. Excellent. Let me go back and talk one more example. If we believe that social media and technology has changed the world, can you tell me what industry do you think is going to dominate the world for the next century? If you think that technology is a market leader and technology has a dominant effect on industry today or on business today, would you all agree that to be in the technology sector, in the IT sector, you are going to have much more work opportunity for the next probably century? Why? It's because information technology is dominating not only our life, but our business and the way we operate. Do you understand that, everyone? Yes or no? Good, excellent. Thank you. Let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation, please. Okay, so C-suite executives or leaders are being asked to work more collaboratively across all functions. So they need to collaborate, they need to communicate, they need to be responsible for everything. As I just said, because a certain salesperson made a comment, the head of sales and the CEO didn't do anything about it, company loses business, the board will ask the CEO to resign and probably ask the chief marketing officer or the chief sales officer to resign because they had not worked collaboratively across the functions to fix the problem before that person took to social media. Line leaders must learn to operate in networks of teams. So we can no longer say, I have 10 sales managers, they all work as individuals because they're afraid that the other sales manager might steal their commission. They must work as part of a team in order for them to be fit into the collaborative environment required in the 21st century. I do know that a lot of companies or organizations still operate the old traditional way, but if they don't change, they will eventually go out of business. 
Many companies today expect new leadership capabilities from their team, even when they are still largely promoting traditional models and mindsets. They say to their team that you need to start looking at being a leader of the 21st century and deliver the same practices that we used to deliver the traditional way as managers. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this, that rather than developing skills and measuring leadership in ways that help leaders effectively navigate greater ambiguity, you need to take charge and ensure that the rapid change to leadership happens without disrupting your business. You need to make sure that the transition to effective leadership happens through engaging both internal and external stakeholders because you do not want to lose your external stakeholders, which are your clients or your suppliers. Because if you lose your external stakeholder who generates your revenue so you can pay salaries, you will go out of business or lose your job. All right, let's talk about results of a survey conducted by Deloitte. Deloitte is one of the world's um, leading HR consultancy firms around the world. They're also into finance and accounting and audit. Deloitte looked at the requirements for a 21st century leader today. 81% of the companies they spoke to said a leader must have the ability to lead through more complexity and ambiguity. A leader must be able to solve any problem that comes to him without having to overlook it or just say it's not important. Nothing is not important. Every problem must be explored and there must be root cause analysis done to every problem to resolve it. Because if you don't do root cause analysis, you're not solving the problem. Does everybody understand the difference between fixing a problem and solving a problem? Who can tell me? Where has Amal gone? Amal, are you here? You've learned this before, Amal. Unmute your microphone. Amal, where are you? Hello, Amal, unmute your microphone. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Tell me, what's the difference between just fixing a problem and getting to the root of the problem? What is the difference? Uh, fixing a problem means that you are trying to fix that problem by trying to, you know, like cope with your mistakes right. and with your with your um with your um problems and right. to decide what's the right target. Right. And and uh, if you dig uh, to the root cause, if you go right to the root cause, what are you doing? You're not fixing. You're not just fixing the problem, but you're stopping it from happening again. Am I right? Correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So which one should companies pursue? Fixing the immediate problem or going to the root cause to solve it permanently? Which one is the correct manner? Solve it permanently. All right. So let me just ask you, if you have a problem in your organization and a customer is complaining, your first priority would be to resolve the customer's problem, correct? Yes, sir. And what is your second priority? To fix it. How would you fix it? Give me the steps. What? Where do you start? I will first ask the customer uh, what is bothering the customer. And right. then I will try to find the solution for that problem. Right. And then I will fix it. All right. So once you've dealt with that problem, and the customer's happy, what do you need to do then to stop the problem from happening again? Prevent it from happening. So you need to find out what caused it, why it happened, how it happened, list down all the possible things that caused it and put processes in place to make yes, sure sir. it can never happen again. Would you agree with yes, me? Yes, sir. Yes, All sir. right. So how do we do that, Amal? What's the term that you've learned before? We said in previous sessions that to get to the root of the problem, you do root analysis, root cause analysis. Is that right? Where you yes, look sir. at the problem, you draw a tree and you go through all the different possibilities. You expose the 
all the issues. You look at what the consequences are, how to fix it, what are the consequences of the fix. You look at whether they're going to be beneficial to the company, long-term or short-term. Then you make a decision on how to fix the problem. Yes, root sir. Root cause analysis. Is that right? Yes, sir. And what's the abbreviation for root cause analysis that you learned before? R-C-A. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Do you remember what I mean by that, Amal, or have you forgotten? Uh, I think I forgot, sir. Sorry, <laughs> okay. sir. That's okay. I'm just reminding you. But do you understand what I mean by but root sir, cause analysis? But, sir, I, I, uh, but sir uh, in the last session when I studied this, I did revise it. Okay, Only good. a All little right. bit I did not understand. No, that's okay. But you explained it well. But I just want you to use the right terminology. That's all, yes, all right? Sir. But you yes, explained sir. it. So let me just fix. When you've resolved the problem for the customer, you're only fixing it cosmetically. You're not fixing the cause, right? So if yes, I sir. solve a problem by calling the customer and apologizing, that's a cosmetic fix. But is that solving the problem? It's not. No. Because to solve the problem, you need to do root cause analysis and eliminate any possible chance of its recurrence. Do you understand what I mean yes, by that? Yes, sir. Yes, Good girl. sir. Excellent. Thank you. Let's move on. So does everybody else understand what Miss Amal just explained? Does everybody understand Amal's explanation? Yes or no? All right. Calm, do you understand Amal's explanation? Can you open your microphone? Hello, Calm. Open your microphone. Unmute your microphone, young lady. Calm. Hi, Calm. Unmute your microphone. Do you want to talk to me? Okay, I'll come back to you later. Thank you. Who else has put their hands up? Okay, Yakub, you've put your hand up. Can you unmute your microphone? Go ahead, Yakubu. Are you there? Hi, you want to talk to me, sir? You need to unmute your microphone if you want to talk to me. Okay, no problem. Hello? Okay, yeah, go ahead, sir. How can I help you? Can you add to what we've just discussed? Uh, uh, what? What I want to add is um, for for you to um, satisfy a customer or for you to get to the root problem, as you have said. But one is said that we should go to the root uh, cause problem. It is for you to find out what really is the issue and how you get to solve the problem so that such customers will not see such attitude next time. And I want to clearly say that first and foremost is that such problem, you do what we call research. You, you set committees, like uh, the, the place I work, if such thing comes out, they will set a committee, the com maybe five committee to check the matter and know why it happened. So after the committee bring their report, then the, every report that the committee presents to the company, that is what the company will act on. So I, I believe get to the committee, go to the root cause problem, see why it happened, see where, how and how to prevent it for the future. No, you're on the right track. Thank you very much. It's a very good explanation. Um, basically, what your all these committees do is they go through what's called root cause analysis, RCA, as Amal has just clarified. And through RCA, they identify all the possible um, causes. Yeah. Then they look at the implications that each cause has. They look at the possible solutions and the advantages and disadvantages of every solution. They report to executive management and come up with a permanent solution. Thank you. You're on the right track. Thank you so much for your input. Okay, let's go on. Um, let's talk. Let's move on with our presentation. Um, I'll go to my next slide. Thank you. So the ability to lead through influence is the second most important element in 21st century leadership. The ability to manage people even through Zoom or through cyberspace or working online remotely plays a very important role in the success of business in the 21st century. Because business in the, first 20, in the 21st century is moving from a traditional office um, sort of business where people go to work every day to a two-faceted way approach, whereby a company can have people working on site, a, pe a, a company can have people working remotely or working from home. It depends on the company's mode of business and type of business. 
The other element is the ability to manage a workforce with a combination of both human beings and technology. Because remember, we said now more than ever, technology plays a major role in the way we do business in the 21st century. Let's look at Amazon. Let's talk about Amazon. Do any of you here think that Amazon could have survived and made so much money from COVID-19 had it not had robots and, um, and robots and technology, sorry, Bear with me for a moment. Okay, so is there any reason you think that um, Amazon could have survived without robots? Is there any reason that you think Amazon could have survived without artificial intelligence in its warehouses? No, the reason why Amazon was able to become the biggest online e-commerce market and service more customers than any of its competitors, whether it's Alibaba or, or Shopee, is because Amazon has warehouses in so many parts of the world. And Amazon ex actually invested in robots and artificial intelligence to run its warehouses. So through that technology, Amazon got results. So if the company can't lead the technology as well as its people and integrate how the people work with the technology, they would have failed. Does anybody know how Amazon uses technology together with humans to ship your order? Can anybody tell me? Does anybody know how Amazon works? Let me tell you. When you go to buy something from Amazon, you go online, you pay for the goods, you put in your credit card number, that goes directly into your customer relationship management base at Amazon. It also sends a message to the warehouse where your goods are held. A label is printed on a machine. It also sends a message to the robot who handles that product. And the robot has to process your label in queue. Say you order a dress. The robot that looks after all dresses or fa fashion or allocated to look after all the 20 or 30,000 fashion items in the warehouse, your order would go straight into that robot's memory and the robot will then pick your order. He will go to the bin in the warehouse. He will pick the dress size 12 in pink that Amal or Iris has ordered, and he will go and drop that to the next available packer. So the girl or guy sitting at the packing desk has a robot drop an item in front of them every 90 to 120 seconds, and they have to pack that item before the robot drops another item. So that's how Amazon ties machinery, technology with human beings. And they work together in a environmental and friendly operation. Because can you imagine if the packing officer doesn't keep up with the robot, the robot will have no place to drop the next order and that will jam his system and the IT department will get an error. Every time that robot drops an order, there is a sensor in the packer's table and the computer system can tell whether that packer is working fast enough or too slow. So if, for example, Rosalind was today packing dresses and the robot dropped one dress, came back 90 seconds later and the bin was still full, there would be a red alarm sent to Rosalind's boss that Roslyn has slowed down, okay? So technology and human beings work in an environment and support each other. Without the robot, Roslyn would not have any goods to pack and they would not need Roslyn. And without Roslyn, no one can pack the goods because the goods have to be properly wrapped. They have to be put in the box in a presentable way. The box has to be sealed. The label has to be stuck down straight. And then the box has to go onto another robot who picks it up and puts it in the right um, bin for the couriers to come and pick it up that day. All right. So do you understand how important the correlation or the communication between people and technology is? Does everybody understand that? Yes or no? 
Okay, all right, let's talk about another integration of people and technology. How many of you have been on a plane recently? Has anybody been on a flight or a jumbo or an Airbus? Thank you very much, Clam. Okay, so when you board a plane today, whether it's the Airbus A350 or A380 or the Boeing 777 or the Boeing 787, the aircraft is now so intellectually advanced, it talks to the captain and the pilot. But if the captain or the pilot don't know how to respond to the robots and the technology effectively, they risk the life of all the passengers. If a captain puts in the wrong signal, the, the artificial intelligence, the autopilot on board the aircraft will sound an alarm to the captain to fix it. If he doesn't fix it, okay, and the robot can't fix it itself, everybody on board that flight die. So captains or pilots today not only need to know how to fly the traditional way, they also need to know how to understand and communicate with the technology, which is far beyond their level of understanding. The technology is precise. It measures the weather outside. It can tell the temperature. It can tell whether there's a storm coming, it can tell if there's any other aircrafts above, below, or at the side through its radar sensors. And the captain needs to understand how to communicate with that robot or that artificial intelligence, that autopilot, in order to be able to work as a pilot today. So does everybody understand the relationship or the correlation between humans and technology? Can you all wave your hands, please? Wave your hands. Don't be shy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so we said a ability to manage a workforce with a combination of both humanoids, human beings, uh, homo sapiens, human beings, and machines. Also, an ability to lead more effectively and more quickly. As my um, fellow, uh, one of your fellow students, Ms. Amal, just said, you need to be able not only to solve the customer's problems straight away, you need to take immediate steps to understand the root cause and fix it. All right, let's move on. So if I want to summarize, what are the most important contexts for leaders of the 21st century? Today, leaders, previously just managers, need to understand new technologies and keep up to date with them. They need to be able to maintain pace of change and be able to maintain the pace of everything that's happening in their external environment, in their customers or in their industry. They need to be able to deal with the changing demographics of their customers and those of their employees and what their employees expect of the company. But more importantly than ever, they need to be prepared for the changing customer because customers today are no longer the customer that they had to deal with in the 1990s, 1970s, 1960s, or 1950s. I keep coming back to this fantastic example, which I correlate with every time um, I teach a lesson, which seems to be the simplest example. When a lady goes to buy a, a pair of shoes, will she buy the pair of shoes because of its price? or because it's a fashion statement with her friends. Ladies only buy shoes that actually are a fashion statement. Okay, you all know it. All you women here do it. Amal does it every time she goes shopping. She goes to a shop. She looks at a pair of shoes. The pair of shoes is only $40, but it's only an everyday pair of shoes. It's nothing special. It's no new fashion. It's the same as the one she has at home. So does Amal buy it? No because she's a new trendy young lady. So Amal will go and look for another shoe which has something different about it, which meets the fashion of today, right Amal? Wave your hand Amal. And then she'll buy that pair of shoes. But if the shoe store 
is so old fashioned that they only keep the traditional styles and don't bring in new styles that young women want. Will that shoe store survive? Yes or no? If you think it won't survive, wave your hands. If you think that shoe store will fail, wave your hands. Okay, do you all understand that? Okay, so when I go to buy t-shirts, if the t-shirt doesn't meet a certain cotton thread, if the t-shirt is not the latest design and it's just a plain white t-shirt, I won't buy it. Why? Because the business is not keeping up with customer trends. Do you all understand that? So if a business understands its customer, what do they have to understand? We spoke about two words in the past and they both start with C. Can anybody tell me what is the principle of understanding your customer? The company must be what? Can anyone tell me? Come on, wake up everyone. What do we call that principle? Your students, you should remember. Jocelyn, what do we call that principle? Go ahead, Jocelyn. Customer centric, yeah. Customer centric, sir. Customer centricity. Good girl, Jocelyn. Everybody clap for Jocelyn. Good girl, young lady. It's called customer centricity. Jocelyn, can you explain to your fellow students what do we mean by customer centricity, please? Go ahead. Hi. Um, we should uh, we should make our customers. Um, their expectations, we should um, give them the good services and the product knowledge and feedback at the same time, sir. So you need to put yourself in your customer's shoes. Is that right? So yes, when sir. you yes, go sir, into, correct, so when the customer comes into the store, the salesperson should understand what that customer expects. Am I right or wrong? Correct, good sir. Girl. Thanks, Jocelyn. Fantastic. Okay. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay, so does everybody understand what I mean by customer centricity or being customer centric? Do you understand that, Rosalind? Rosalind? Thank you, Rosalind. Can anybody else give me an example of an, uh, an instance where a business has failed to be customer centric? Who can give me an example? A business that you went to that lacked customer centricity. Come on, somebody should be able to give me one. Okay, let's talk to Amal again. Amal is very active today. I'm so proud of you. Amal, tell me, what's an example of a business that you have faced an issue with where they don't understand their customer? They, they don't understand the needs that the customer wants. Okay. And, and, they, and, they, don't, and they lack a listening problem. Great. So what happens usually when that happens? What happens to the customer? They leave. And if they leave, what, what effect does that have on the company? The company goes broke. All right. Let, let me break it down for you, Amal, because now you're, you've been studying for months and you need to become more technical. So I want you to work through this with me. If the, yes, company, if the company doesn't understand its customer, they will not be able to sell to that customer. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right, so all the money they've invested in advertising for that customer will be lost, correct? Yes, sir. The customer life cycle, the value of that customer is lost because it costs them $20 to get that customer to come into the store through advertising. The customer came into the store. They weren't able to meet his expectations. He'll go away and not come back. So that is dollars lost, correct? The, yes, other sir. Loss, the other loss is the fact that he will go and tell his friends, correct? And correct. his friends will not trust the brand. So they lose trust in that brand. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's, what's another thing they'll lose? They'll lose reputation and they'll lose yes. future income from yeah. the influencer, right? Who was yes, the influencer, sir. Amal? The customer that came into the store will end up going out and becoming a negative influencer. Am I right or wrong? Yes, sir. You're right. Can you tell me what I mean by negative influencer? A negative influencer means that you will not get a good feedback. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Yes. Good. And uh, that you will be, uh, your company is going to become notorious. All right. And, and, and you will, and you lose the job and you need to, and you need to focus on the customer and 
give what the customer wants because if you want to be a good influencer, you have to listen to what the customer has to say. If you want to be a good influencer as a company, you need to actually listen to your customer. But if you want positive influences, you have to listen to your customer. Otherwise, they'll influence yes, negative sir. feedback. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Yes, fine. Sir. So let me let me take it one step further, ladies and gentlemen. Today, more than ever, if a customer is satisfied, he tells 12 people minimum. If a customer is dissatisfied, he will tell 24 people minimum. Do you understand that? So which one do you prefer? Him to tell 12 people about how satisfied he is or for him to tell 24 people how dissatisfied he is? Which one do you think will be more detrimental to your business? Positive or the 24 negative? 12. The 12 positive would be more helpful for your business, right? They yes, would be sir. more helpful. For negative, the 24 negative comments are going to cause you a lot of damage. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Does everybody understand that? Yes or no? Thank you, Amal. Do you understand, Raquel, what Amal just explained? Are you there, Raquel? Go ahead, Raquel. Do you understand that, Raquel? Yes, sir. Are you there, Raquel? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, do you understand uh, what Amal just explained? Yes. Okay. yes, sir. So a satisfied customer tells 12. A dissatisfied customer tells 24. 24 Which one would you prefer? Yeah. Would you prefer the satisfied or the dissatisfied? I would prefer the satisfied. I would prefer the satisfied customer because definitely the satisfied customer will tell friends and family what kind of uh, um, experience that uh, uh, she has on the, on the shop or in the business Excellent. itself. Yeah. You tell me about a negative experience you had that you told your friends about. Do you have any examples? I, yes, I do have. Give me um, one. A couple of months ago, I was in the supermarket. It's a European supermarket here in the UAE, especially yep. in, in my place. It's called Viva, okay? Yeah, I These know These kind of supermarkets really that uh, they do have a lot of um, cheap prices, but yep. really it's a good, um, you know, it's uh, affordable and um, you, really, you, you can really um, save money. Right, and but what unfortunately, happened? Yeah, there is a uh, there's a sh shop manager that it seems that he's always behind behind the behind his office. I don't know what he's yeah. doing, and then I do complain about uh, because weekly I do shopping in that yes. in that supermarket. Okay, yeah, go on. Is that um they they do have uh, a staff that doesn't know um do cashiering. I mean, I like it seems that he's new. The thing is that um I asked the the price of the of the sugar. And yeah. then I said, "Is it in the in the in the in the in the uh, on promotion? It's in the sale because there it's th this price is stating the you know yeah. the amount of the, the the sugar. While you scan different uh, different price, and then he asked me, can you check again the price?' I said, "What?" He asked you to go and check the yeah. price. Well, if I yeah. was a customer, you know what I would have done? I would have said, "Listen, I don't want to buy anything anymore. Goodbye." I would have left all the groceries there and walked out. Is that what you did? I no, because you know I I, I understand that because I don't want him to, I don't want him to lose a job. So I said, can you ask someone to help you? And then he went out to to his uh, pause and checked the price. And then when he's giving me the bill and I'm waiting because he, he scanned it and I I gave my card. And then I said, where is my bill? Then he went to trash bin and find my bill. So I complained to the store manager and the store manager really uh, talked to me in a rude way. Immediately, I emailed the, I, I emailed the company. They went back to me. I said, I don't, I don't want to give my number because I know what they are go going to do is that to, to offer me something, give, or I don't need that. I didn't come back to the same um, supermarket again. And I told my family member, I told the rest of my friends my experience. Hello. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to the okay. network. Okay, let's go. go. I was talking to the young lady. Where are you? Where's the young lady I was talking to? Are you there? 
Raquel? Hi, yes, Raquel. Sir. So tell me, what did you do? Did you walk out or what happened? Oh, you didn't hear me. I, <laughs> I talk a lot. What happened? No, I did not. I did Are you not there, talk. Raquel? I, I, I called the, yeah? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, go on. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I call. I told him to call the, 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 um, the store manager. But unfortunately, the, the store manager, even he is so, he is so rude to me. And then I said that the, I, I, I told him what, what happened. And then he said that. Uh, so, what is your problem? He gave you. He went to the trash bin and, and, and give you the, give you the bill. I said, what? This is the way how you talk to me. And then I said, wait. What is your name? This is my name. I am, I am the store manager. He said. I said, are you sure that you are the store manager? It seems that this shop doesn't have a store man manager. This is the first time I saw your face because most of the, uh, most of the manager are in the, uh, on the floor helping customer because there's okay. run of hot so, stuff. So I, Raquel, did, like you, did you find the name of the brand and complain to his head office? I did, yes, I did complain and they, they emailed me back and asking me for, uh, for my telephone number, and I know the I know the deal. What they're going to do? They're going to send me back to that to that uh, to that supermarket and talk and and give some give some gift. And I don't need that. I need right, someone but, to yeah. Okay, to, but what, to fix let, problem. Okay, let, let me relate it. So you're now telling your friends and two hundred people here about that brand. Mm -hmm. So have you yeah. what what damage do you think you've done to that brand by telling 200 people? Would it have been cheaper for him to help you and apologize or cheaper for him to let you walk out disappointed? Which one do you think would have been cheaper for him? Uh, the second one? No, obviously not. He should have helped you. Know. If he helped you. But he did not. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Because he didn't help you, he's now suffering the more expensive outcome, right? Because you're telling 200 people. So now you've caused more damage to his reputation and the brand reputation. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm but giving you an what example. I did, but I did, but I did, sir. I am, I'm, I, I, will, I, I did something that irritate them. It irritate yes, exactly the, 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 the shop. I went to the other, to the other branch. Yeah. You went to another branch. That's okay. Yeah. But what you've done yeah. is you've lost, he has lost not just the customer. He has lost the reputation of the brand to 215 people now that you've told him about it. So you've caused him more damage simply because he wasn't customer centric. Thank you for sharing that, Raquel. Okay. All right. So does everybody understand the importance of customer centricity? Customer centricity is really important in the 21st century. Let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation, please. Okay, let me go back. All right, so remember we said the pace of change? Okay, new technology, the pace of change, customer expectations and demographics, okay? So remember, if leaders don't understand these four main concepts of change and put them into context, then they will not be able to survive in the 21st century. Remember, they need to have the ability to lead through complex problems and deal with ambiguity. Obviously, the example of the manager that couldn't solve the price problem that Rosalind just told about us doesn't meet that requirement. The ability to manage effectively he doesn't meet the ability to actually manage his cashier and the computer system which had the wrong price he failed so ladies and gentlemen remember leadership for the 21st century needs to be effective and you know not only my definition but the definition of leadership consultants all over the world says that effective leadership in the 21st century means operating in a new context characterized by changing demographics and customer expectations. The influx of new technology and a rapid pace of change. 
refreshing one's view of this context is essential to determine how leaders can combine traditional expectations with new leadership competencies to help their organizations pursue success. So what we've said about it today is the difference between having a leader who is passive, that doesn't care, like the supermarket manager that Rosalind just told us about, and an active leader who would have fixed the problem on the spot. Let me talk about the difference. The active leadership role in the 21st century means that the leader gives constant feedback to his team. The leader creates genuine relationships with his co-leaders. The leader mentors everybody in the company through his leadership team. He coaches his leadership team and he creates a positive image for his team. And that positive image could include promoting customer centricity. The leader communicates effectively, the leader makes decision, and the leader creates an environment that people crave. Can I ask you, do you think the manager that served Roslyn created an environment that Roslyn craves? Obviously not because she just told 215 people about the lack of customer centricity or lack of service or the lack of him being able to deal with a computer error, cashier error, which he just defended and wasn't prepared to resolve. Okay, so leaders in the 21st century who avoid taking necessary action when problems arise, similar to that in the supermarket, and refrain from rewarding and punishing employees when they should will fail because they are being passive. Remember, passive, they don't care. 21st century leaders who have a negative impact on how employees perceive their roles can cause role conflict, ambiguity, and overload. So this cashier wasn't interested in checking the correct price. The manager was negative and did not care about correcting the employee's error, but trying to say that the employee was right when he was wrong is simply because the leader, the manager, doesn't give a damn and doesn't care. He is not focused on leading or building customers in the 21st century. Passive leadership is a leader who is constantly reacting to situations, a leader that avoids addressing things that need to be addressed, a leader that takes a laissez-faire approach to everything, and a leader that does not give feedback. Passive leadership. A laissez-faire approach means simply, in simple terms, more of a no-care approach, everything will be okay. All right, and I don't want to make it too complicated, but that is a very, very, very same definition of the manager that the young student um, just defined in the supermarket she went to in Dubai. Remember, being an active leader means that you have to be able to manage people. There is five sources that managers today or leaders today, traditional managers who are being transformed to leaders in the 21st century need to have in order to operate a system and take decisions for their organization. They need to be actually appointed as leaders or managers. They need to have coercive power. They need to have reward power. They need to have expert power and they need to have referent power. Legitimate power, is means that they're legitimately managers. Coercive power is the power to tell people what to do and to get the job done. Reward power is to reward people when they do the job properly or reward customers when needed. Expert power is to know their business. For example, the cashiers, the POS system, the computer in that supermarket, didn't know the correct price. There was obviously an error from the computer or from the people who programmed that computer. And he has to have the power to refer the problem and get it fixed or escalate the problem to his IT department. 
So managers or leaders in the 21st century need to have power, not only one type of power, but all five different feeds of power. Not only do they have to have the power, they have to actually bring trust and credibility amongst their employees and their customers. Number one, integrity. Number two, competence. Number three, consistency, loyalty, and openness. All of these five elements are the basic elements of trust. If a leader of the, ter of the 21st century can't build trust, he cannot lead effect. Understand what I mean by that? Does everybody understand what I mean by that? Does everybody understand what I meant by that? Could you see my PowerPoint? Okay, so what I said before, leaders of the 21st century need to be active, not passive. What do I mean by a passive leader? It's a leader who avoids or delays taking necessary action, similar to the um, leader that Raquel, I think it was Raquel or Roslyn, described in the supermarket. Okay, he wasn't able to deal with the issue that she raised. He wasn't able to solve it. So leaders like that who are old traditional managers who avoid or delay taking necessary action when problems arise and in particular refrain from rewarding and punishing employees are what we call a passive leader. If I go back to that and show you what I meant here, remember we said that leadership today needs to be effective. Effective leadership in the 21st century means operating in a new context characterized by changing demographics. Changing demographics means understanding the needs of today's customer, understanding what being a customer centric business means, understanding customer expectations. The customer expects that the price of the sugar on the shelf is the same as the price of sugar that the customer pays when they get to the checkout, which is not what Raquel experienced. Refreshing one's view of this context is essential in today's leadership context. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that if you continue to operate as traditional managers and do not adopt leadership in the 21st century, you will not be able to maintain business success because the world is becoming a lot more techno advanced. Customers' expectations are growing day by day and customers expect a lot more. That's why customer centricity plays a big role as a result of not only technological change, environmental change, but customer expectations. Let's talk about it. The active leader is one who's involved, and I'll tell you more about them shortly. The passive leader is one that doesn't care and doesn't know what active leadership is. A passive leader is a manager of 1979 or 1980. Let's look at the characteristics again of active leadership. I apologize for Zoom failing a few minutes ago. I sincerely apologize, please forgive me. All right, let's go on. So active leadership in the 21st century means that the leader must constantly give feedback to his employees. The leader must create genuine relationships between him and the team that he has working for him, right from the C-level suite all the way down to the junior executive. The leader must become a mentor, not just a manager that pushes and threatens and people run away from him because they hate working with him. The leader must mentor and lead. When a, when a leader leads, all the people that work for him will follow and respect him. That is the leader of the 21st century. The leader has to also be a coach. Remember like when you play football or netball or basketball at school, you have a coach who trains you. 
the leader has to do that, not only to his fellow people in the sea level or C-suite, but to the people below them all the way down to the cleaner who cleans the store or cleans the office. The leader must create a vision. He must be open-minded and always looking at the future. He must always be taking into account what do the people who work from him expect, for him expect? What do the employees expect from him as a leader? What do his customers expect? And what does he have to do to keep up with technology and customer expectations? The leader must communicate effectively. He must be able to make decisions and he must create an environment that both the customers crave and the people who work for him enjoy coming to work. That defines the difference between an active leader and a passive leader. So let me ask you again, um, where is the young lady? Uh, Raquel, where are you, Raquel? Tell me, Raquel, the manager that you met in the supermarket, was he an active leader or a passive leader? Go ahead, unmute your microphone, please. He's a passive leader, sir. All right. Is he the sort of leader you want to see in a supermarket or not? No, never. Thank you very much. I've been, Thank you, I, I've been also I've been also a manager of McDonald's for four years, so I know how to handle those kind of uh, people. Well, let me tell you, if you did that to a McDonald's customer and your operations manager found out, you would get a oh warning <laughs> and you probably, if you did it the next day, exactly. you'd be out of a job because McCopco, exactly. McDonald's company um, in the US has very strict operational procedures and if they're not followed it tarnishes the mcdonald's brand all over the world you know what i mean by that is that right yes sir. yes thank you very much okay all right yes. so let's go on so does everybody understand what i mean the difference between a passive and an active leader lydia do you understand that can you open your microphone for me lydia unmute your microphone lady young lady can yes, you unmute your good microphone? Good evening, hi everyone. lydia how are you today young lady I'm good, sir. I'm good. Tell me, do you understand the difference between an active and a passive leader? Yeah, so the active uh, leaders, um, they take initiative. They take initiative. Very good. And yeah, if and they then take... Whereas the proactive, uh, the passive uh, leaders are, uh, they, they make, the, uh, they delay the action. They they uh, wait for the things to happen and then that's the time they will they will respond they delay Fantastic. excellent so lydia can i ask you in your business or your organization do you still see examples of passive leadership yes yeah, sir and what does that do to you and the morale of everyone well it's like we are uh, feel disappointed and so right. we don't want to, you know, lead by those people who are pro or who are passive. Right. So you'd rather have a leader who's active that can lead you properly, right? Right. Do you understand the difference between the idea of push, run, lead, pull? Do you understand that difference? Do you understand what I mean by it? Sorry, sir. Okay. Let me explain. Managers who are passive usually push their staff their staff run because they push you to do things. But because they don't lead you effectively on how to do it, what happens is the staff become resentful and run. They don't want to do it. But from an effective leader who leads, mentors you, coaches you, motivates you to do it, staff will follow. So do you understand what I mean by lead and follow, push and run? Yes, sir. Okay, so which one do you prefer? push and run or lead and follow lead and follow of course thank you very much Lydia. good thank stuff you, thank you okay let me go back to my presentation i have a question here from another student yes go ahead victoria can you unmute your microphone for me please go ahead victoria uh, sir just to add up between passive and active leadership yes uh, coming up the what if you are a passive leader you you tend to be reactive while if you are an active leader, you are proactive. And also like what was mentioned, when you are an active leader, you take initiative in, and you make things happen. 
while if you're a passive leader, you just wait for things to happen. And also one very good uh, characteristics of a good, uh, an active leader nowadays in uh, the modern century is that they give meaningful feedback. Fantastic. That's right. And that's what I said in active leadership. They yeah. have to mentor and give feedback. And it means listening, not hearing. Because when you listen, information goes in, you analyze, you ask questions, you give feedback, you ask more questions, you come to consensus. Where listening, where if you're hearing, you do what I do when my wife complains about something. Information goes in one ear, out the other ear, and I say nothing. So in effective communication, we must listen, not hear. All right, everyone? Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Let's go on. Does everybody understand what we just spoke about? Right? Okay. Let's go on. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Here we go. Just one moment for a minute, please. Okay. All right. So um, remember... Being a passive leader is not an option in today's business world. It can't be an option. I'll come back to you in a minute, Yakubali. All right. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so passive leadership is a leader who constantly reacting and not resolving. Okay, because if he was a active leader and the problem happened, he would do root cause analysis and resolve it. But a passive leader doesn't do anything of that nature. He just reacts day by day. The passive leader avoids addressing things that need to be addressed. He takes a laissez-faire approach to everything and does not give feedback to his staff and therefore his staff will not learn anything and run. All right, let's move on. The most important part of being an effective manager or what we call a leader in the 21st century and being able to bridge the gap and continue being successful is to develop trust. And you need to bring trust into the way you lead your business. And for you to do that, you must promote integrity, competence, consistency, loyalty and openness does everybody understand what i mean by integrity honesty being honest and upfront competence know what you're talking about be consistent with your decisions be loyal to your company and your customers and be open do not keep secrets and do not hide from the problem okay does everybody understand that trust all right, so now let's look at the other obstacles that leaders in the 21st century don't always take into account, and that's why they fail. Most leaders here today, if I said, tell me what are the geopolitical volatilities that your company faces today, they would say, I don't know. Geopolitical factors are those that can cause sudden and destructive damage to an organization. Unstable geopolitical environments, for example, the war between Russia and the Ukraine and the issues that's caused in the energy and petroleum sectors in some parts of the world, they are a geopolitical volatility which has caused a problem. Okay, we can talk about geopolitical environments and they basically, as a result of these volatilities, they cause a chase away of capital investment and drain financial assets. And that's very clear in Russia. Because of the war with the Ukraine, many manufacturers and businesses have stopped deal doing business with Russia or with the Russian government and have stopped buying or selling to that part of the world, which has caused not only a chase away of capital investment in Russian technology and Russian infrastructure and Russian trade, but also a drain on the financial assets and the finances and the economy of Russia. High political Russian, sorry, high political volatility could also lead to stricter government regulations in local markets, which make it more costly for companies to conduct business in certain geographies. Well, that has happened because thanks to the war between Russia and the Ukraine, the world has become very, very negative towards Russia. And Russia has caused a geopolitical 
volatility between them and the rest of the world. Many countries have barred all business with Russia. People around the world have refused to travel to Russia. Companies have withdrawn their brands from Russia because if they leave their brand in Russia, it would be seen that they support the war between Russia and the Ukraine. Starbucks, McDonald's, KFC, and many international brands have pulled their business out of Russia. Nike, Adidas, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, they have stopped doing business in Russia because if they continue doing business there, it would be seen that they support the volatility between Russia and the Ukraine. Let's go on to another thing that companies do not actively recognize. And this tells you whether a leader is a leader in the 21st century or a leader of the traditional management style that doesn't work. The 21st century has been characterized by technological disruption with futurologists and trend experts saying that disruption is a norm today. That's true. If you do not understand technology and the effect that technology and social media can cause today, then you cannot be successful as a leader in today's business world. Technological disruption has impacted organizations in all industries and sectors, starting from healthcare to manufacturing to computing, data mining, collection of data. Let me give you an example. If it wasn't for technology and computers, do you think that Amazon would be the world's leader in e-commerce platforms? Do you think that Bezos, Jeff Bezos, would have become one of the world's most successful e-commerce platform operators and one of the richest businesses in the world? No, it was because he understood the need for technological disruption when COVID-19 hit. He understood that unless he makes technology and people work together and able to deal with the implementation or the disruption caused by technology, Amazon would have failed. Data mining firms are building databases of human DNA to evolve the science of personal identification. 3D printers are being used to print building equipment, everyday products, entire houses and artificial human organs. And the combination of cloud computing and artificial intelligence has opened hidden doors, has opened markets that companies never, ever expected to go into previously. If you as a leader don't understand the consequences and are unable to deal with technological disruption or geopolitical disruptions, you are doomed to fail. The other type of disruption is economic and political uncertainty. Today in the 21st century, as a result of COVID-19, we live in a world of economic and political uncertainty. With the war in Russia and the Ukraine, there is political uncertainty as to whether Russia will change its leader soon or not. There is constant uncertainty about Israel and its leader because of the problem with Palestine. There is an ongoing struggle of power between Taiwan and China. Who knows what will happen there? All of these issues in the Asia Pacific or the Asia Circle, as well as the European economic circle are causing economic and political uncertainty, not only for governments, but for economies and companies operating in those regions. And what we say is when organizations filter down geopolitical risks at an individual country level, they have to deal with the economic and political uncertainty, like companies and people who run businesses and investments in Russia have had to do since this Ukraine war started. Okay, they need to deal with how to operate in a non-stable economy and unstable economic and political environment. Country environments characterized by frequent wars, labor strikes, social unrest, and chaos can have severe and drenched detrimental, hurtful impact on the revenue and profit or investments of any business or financial organization. You all know that. Airlines were grounded due to economic and political uncertainty as a result of COVID. But was COVID a political uncertainty? No, 
It was an environmental uncertainty. It was a disease that the world never expected. Managing economic and political uncertainty has become a prime competency that leaders have to understand. For example, if Lydia ran a restaurant and that restaurant did not deliver food to its customers during COVID-19, Lydia would have faced bankruptcy had she run that restaurant. Lydia had to be able to deal with implementing technological change through online ordering through a website, deal with economic and political uncertainty by the law banning people from eating in her restaurant by able to offer people online ordering choices and having food delivered to them. So Lydia would have been able to scale up and meet the needs of COVID-19 and the uncertainty that COVID-19 created in order for her restaurant to survive. Mr. Govan, somebody is drawing on my screen. Can you please fix it? Thank you. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, does everybody understand about the uncertainties I've spoken about? Geopolitical volatility, number one, write it down. Number two, technological disruptions, Amal. Are you writing this down, Amal? Okay, good. And number three, economic and political uncertainty. Next one is shifting demographics. What do I mean by shifting demographics? It's the demographics and the countries you live in. And let's talk about that because this is a very critical area that a lot of you fail to realize. Let me talk to you, everyone here, about demographics, all right? Can I ask you all, are the demographics of the people that you deal with every day, do you think they're the same as they were before? Are they the same? They're not. The demographics today have changed. Demographics are not the same. Let me talk to some people here and see if they understand. Abdurrahman Saeed Muhammad, can you unmute your microphone for me, please? Go ahead. Hi, Abdurrahman. Do you understand what I mean by demographic change? Uh, I hear you. Do you understand what I mean by demographics? Yes, uh, demographic change demographics is uh, when people in the city or in the business, uh, the, the, city, the, 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 the city, which the company yeah. or business. Uh, yes. All right. Okay. Well, let me tell you about no, demographics. Or I'm uh, sorry, I can't. For example. Yes. Go ahead. In my country, uh, uh, there are some cities which where well, it's the very hot. Uh, yes. uh, people, uh, 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 I'm sorry, Abdurrahman, I can't hear you. Your microphone is not working. I'll come back to you, sir. Thank you. From one, uh, yeah, go on. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Abdurrahman. Your microphone is not working, sir. Okay, I'll come back to you. Let me talk to Shaquille. Hi, Shaquille. Can you unmute your microphone? Are you there, Shaquille? Uh, yes, ahead. sir. Can you hear me? Tell me, yeah, tell me, what do you understand by demographic volatility? Can you explain that to everyone? Yes, sir. Demographic means that uh, the people from different ethnicity living in a particular area from different backgrounds. So basically, in short, it means how diverse a society is. Right. And how, why is it important for people or companies to understand the demographics they're dealing with? What effect would it have on the company if they don't understand demographics? Can you explain that? Yes, obviously, because company needs to understand that the people from different backgrounds have different interests. So, for example, like uh, if I mention that I'm a Muslim and I usually prefer halal food. So the company right. living in a Muslim area, if they do not recognize this, obviously they won't have any sales. Absolutely right. So understanding customer demographics is the same as being customer centric and understanding your market. Would you agree with that, everyone? Do you understand that, Moham, uh, Shaquille? Are you there, Shaquille? Yes, Hello, sir. Sha I, I understand. Yes, I thank, agree with thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let me go and talk to Yakubali. Hello, Yakubali. Are you there? 
Yeah, uh, switch on. Yeah, could you? Yeah, go yes. ahead, Yakubali. Would you like to add to that? What do you understand by customer demographics and the volatility of demographics? Yes, sir. Uh, good to see you. Uh, first of all, uh, customer the democracy does mean. Uh, I think it's a multicultural mean uh, people um, that the path of diversity. There's uh, mean uh, many people who come from different uh, ethnic, and then they will uh, they will join together. I think it's a positive for uh, some uh, for the some. Uh, Factor of some uh, uh, some factor. I think it's uh, the positive thing that people they will work together and they will understand much more. The better in uh, for, because they will uh, meet from different uh, country and it's important for the culture, you knowing okay. each other. Okay, thank you, thank you, Yakubeli. You're thank on the right track. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, let's go on. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, let me go back to the academic understanding of. Um, demographic volatility. If you don't understand the demographics of your customers, you will have no customers to cater for. Let me give you a simple example that all of you here should understand. When ladies go to buy shoes, unless the shoe store has the right shoe style or design to meet the needs of different aged women, those women will not buy. Your 21-year-old teenager will not buy the shoes that your 55-year-old mother will buy. Young ladies like Lydia, Roslyn, uh, Raquel, um, Amal, Catherine, Cecilia, Sumia, Jocelyn, and all the young ladies here today, Iris, will not buy the shoes that your grandmothers had to buy. Am I right or wrong? Do you agree with me? Wave your hand, Catherine. Okay, so unless that shoe store is able to provide you styles that meet your demographic, you will not do business with them. Am I right? Wave your hands, everyone. Okay. Good stuff. Excellent. Do you understand that, Lori Bell? Can you wave your hand, Lori Bell? Good girl. I need to see you smile, Lori Bell. You're not smiling today. Show me your beautiful smile, young lady. Good on you. Good stuff. All right. Let's go on, guys. Let's go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so what we said is major demographic changes occurring on a global scale, which include changing family structures, increase of dual income, single parent income, aging populations require more health and welfare, as well as um, people becoming more environmental friendly and an increase in the salaries of people working, drawing a clear line between the poor, the middle class and the upper class, that is a shifting demographic that each business must understand in its market. The shifts in demographic makeup means that the demand for a company's products and service is subjected to their continuous ability to meet demographic changes. Otherwise, they will meet an ongoing fluctuation in business and eventually go out of business because the people that leave will go to the competitor. It means that there is a constant pressure on the company's portfolio of products to remain relevant and up to date. For leadership teams, this is a challenge in terms of creating forecasts for growth or for mapping out a sustainable growth strategy and new products. And that goes back to all the skills we've spoken about, about being proactive rather than passive. So if you're an active manager, you're proactive, not passive. If you're passive, then you will not be meeting shifting demographics and the business will suffer. Okay, let me go on. Who else have I got here? Okay. Um, let's talk to Lori Bell. Lori Bell, do you understand what I've just asked? Lori Bell, can you unmute your microphone? Are you there, Laurie Bell? I'm here, sir. Do you understand what I mean by demographics, Laurie Bell? Oh, yeah. Do you understand why it's important for a company to meet demographic requirements and understand its customers? Yes. Good on you. Thank you, Laurie Bell. Okay. Thank you. All right. right. Let's. right. You're welcome. Let's go to the next slide. A company needs to meet the demands of resilience. Resilience is the backbone of leadership. 
if the company can't be resilient and meet change, whether it's economic, whether it's geopolitical, or whether it's demographic change, if it can't be resilient and meet those, the company is destined for failure. So if its management is not resilient, by being leaders of the 21st century, they will fail. Rapidly changing consumer demand patterns, which is a change in customer demographics, ever increasing pace of technology induced disruption, such as online shopping rather than going to a brick and mortar shop, increasing fragmentation of markets by a lot of competitors and new players in your market, rapid shift of economic growth potential, increasingly fluid labor markets and the rising cost of labor. All of these, okay, will have an impact on your company if your company can't fight and react by being resilient. In some countries now, the cost of entry into a new business is cheaper because real estate dropped thanks to COVID-19. People have learned that they don't need such big office space and there's more empty office and shop spaces. So that has caused a drop in the entry price into a business, which attracts a lot more people to compete in business. So therefore, unless you have a sense of resilience to be able to deal with this and counteract that, your business will fail. All right, so how do we ensure that the business remains effective moving forward? Leaders of the 21st century must handle these issues on an ongoing basis. Dismantling all forms of discrimination that your company practices or practice. Your company needs to constantly determine the value and assess the real impact of globalization, geopolitical problems, changes in customer demographics and economic changes in the world in order to be able to continue. We need as a global community to bring an end to military and terrorist conflict by making sure that we do not support countries that run military and terrorist conflict, similar to what the world's biggest brands have just done in Russia. They have pulled out because of the conflict with the Ukraine. Because if they don't pull out, their customers will see that as they support war and terrorism. So in order to maintain their brand, they pulled out to protect their brand. Companies must understand the future of consumerism. And to understand the future of consumerism, it means that the, cons the companies have to be customer centric. They must be consumer centric. They must understand the difference between autocratic and democratic systems of government, both inside their company and externally by government. In China, it's an autocratic government that dictates. In most other countries, it's democratic. So whether you are based in an autocratic or democratic country, you must understand how to survive in that government or in that geopolitical environment. The reduction of carbon emissions has to play an important role for every company. The world and consumers are now becoming more environmental friendly. And if companies don't support the reduction in carbon emission and general pollution, okay, they will lose customer base because customers are now very concerned about the environment. Most big brands, whether it's Starbucks or McDonald's, have already shown their aim to reduce carbon emission by pulling out paper straws. They then now no longer use plastic straws. They no longer even offer paper straws. They have pulled out straws altogether. But the reason they stop straws is because the production of plastic and straws is a cause for carbon emission. So they no longer use them. So a lot of companies now are running away from anything that goes against the environment, protecting the ecosystem. Companies are developing more sustainable ways of getting their raw materials through sustainable farming, sustainable food production, and 
better water management systems. And companies have to show to their consumer market that they support these sorts of environmental programs in order to retain their environmental sensitive customers. And that is getting bigger every day. And this is part of understanding your customer market and your customer demographics. They have to understand how to prepare for significant changes in the demographics of the world's population. In Singapore, 50% of the population is age heading towards retirement. The other 50% are either working generation, X, X generation or millennials, okay? Or they are school kids that are still studying. Let's talk about the X, the Y and the Z generations. We've talked about this before. And that tells you that in every country, you have a different mix of X, Y and Z. And in Singapore, the new generation, the millennials, the people aged between like 20 and 45 who are actively working and pushing the economy forward, they represent well under 50%. The other 50% are already aged in retirement, but that mix changes in every country. Com companies need to recognize the fairness, stability and effectiveness of meeting the financial systems in their country and the eradication of poverty and starvation. Many companies now actually donate to charity or actually tell the world that they are trying to support poor countries and eradicate poverty. Look at Microsoft. Microsoft donates computers and software to schools in third world countries every year, thanks to the legacy that Bill Gates created. And the Bill Gates Foundation also does the same. Many brands around the world are doing this. Companies, governments are moving towards providing accessible health care for all, especially for their staff and their employees whether it's through medical insurance or whether it's through making sure that if their staff or employees need medical attention, they get it and that helps motivate their staff. Because a lot of people, when they work for a company, being able to be provided accessible health care so they can afford medical treatment should they get sick is a very important ingredient of accelerating the future and growing your business education that is fit for purpose and helps prepare the people in your organization for the future. Pardon me. So all of these are steps that companies have to take as they move into the future. Let me summarize this in some simple examples of the strategic way that companies and managers need to lead into the future. The first element is what we call the joint strategic view. And this summarizes what we've also spoken about. It's by knowing in which direction the company is going by developing a joint view where your organization and all the people at C-suite or C-level, the leaders understand and have a clear view and agreed and are embraced to achieve the same result. The other one, is leadership bench strength. And what I mean by that is by having the right people, capable, engaging, active leaders at all levels. Have people in place that take the initiative and that are able to guide and carry the other junior members of the team forward with them, not be passive and leave them behind. Otherwise your organization might be left behind. The organization and its C-suite, its C-level leaders need to practice agile execution with discipline. And that means having, um, again, Mr. Govan, I have somebody drawing on my screen. Having strong and flexible execution habits in place, creating and maintaining routines and disciplines to trigger and enable proper management and follow-up action and consistency all the time. Not only when a problem happens, but day in, day out, every hour of the day, there needs to be 
agile execution with discipline. If you don't have the, these three windows of joint strategic view by the management team, leadership strength throughout the company, and an ability to execute quickly and make decisions effectively in a disciplined manner, then leadership in the 21st century will fail. All right, let's stop sharing my slides and let me go back and ask, does everybody here today understand what I said about leadership in the 21st century? Do you understand about where companies are failing? I have only told you about some failures. I could speak about this for 10 hours and I could put up another 100 PowerPoints. But what I'm trying to do today is give you a quick understanding of some of the biggest issues that companies fail to understand in leadership in the 21st century. Does everybody understand what I've explained today? If you don't, please ask me because I, it would be waste of my time if you don't understand. I am here to teach, to, to actually make you understand. I am here to pass on knowledge as a trainer. Please feel free to raise your hand and talk to me. I want to hear from you. That motivates me to, to come back and do this again. Tell me, what is it that some of you don't understand? I'm sure there's 50 questions that I need to answer. Let's start from, um, should I pick or is somebody going to volunteer? Come on, guys, don't make me pick names. I hate picking names. All right, where's Catherine? Catherine? Catherine Beniston, you haven't spoken to me today. Wake up, Catherine. Good afternoon, ma'am. How are you today? Beautiful. Hi, hello. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Okay, hello. Catherine, do you understand what today's lesson is about? Have I helped yeah. you at all today? Uh, yes, I uh, I do understand of what you are uh, teaching us today. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, but I okay. don't have any question. Okay, Catherine, can I ask you, do you understand the difference between a manager and a leader now? Yes, the, the manager, the, uh, the leader and the manager is um, the different. If you become a leader, you have, to, you have to lead or you have to be a mentor to all of your staff. Yeah. Right. And a manager? A manager is um, to, solve, to solve the problems of what we have, especially on the business. Like, um, for example, if there's any problem with the with the um, okay, let me let me let me just step in and correct you, Catherine. You're confusing <laughs> the fact. All right, just let me tell you something, Catherine. A leader, a leader, if he's an effective leader, he solves problems, but he doesn't just fix the problem today. That's the difference. A manager will only fix the problem today, and that's why he will fail eventually. Because if he's a leader which is a 21st century manager, he will not only fix today's problem, but then he will go to find out the root cause of the problem through root cause analysis and work with his team to make sure that that problem never happens again. So there's a difference between a leader and a manager. Do you understand that? Okay, let me just give you a simple explanation, Catherine. A leader leads by example, okay? He gets to the bottom of it. He mentors, coaches, and develops his team. A manager actually gives instructions, solves the immediate problem, and his staff are scared of him and run away. Do you understand the difference, Catherine? Yes, Catherine, or no, Catherine? I can't hear you. Go ahead. Yes, I got it. Okay. Catherine, I yeah. Are you gonna are you gonna are you gonna become a 21st century leader or a 1970s manager? Which one do you class yourself as? 21 centuries. Good I on you, Catherine. Active. Good on you, Catherine. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you in next week's business I talk. I don't oh, want to and, be the passive. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you in the next leadership series. Thank you so much, Catherine. Have a nice day. Amal, you put up your hand. Can I help you? Go ahead, Amal. What have you learned today, Amal? Uh, sir, I have learned that you have to be customer centric, and you have to be you have to understand your customer, and you uh, have to understand, and you have to build a trust, and you have to uh, give feedback, 
and all the information you talked today, sir, all of that, I understand. All right. So you remember what I meant by root cause analysis, which you had forgotten, RCA. Do you remember what that means? Uh, no, sir. <laughs> Emma, what are you doing to me, Emma? Sorry, okay. sir. I, I am having a little problem understanding that. Okay. Root cause analysis is when you investigate what is causing the problem uh, yes, sir. and you yes, try sir. to yes, solve sir. the problem. Yes, All right? sir. Yes, yes, sir. Root yes, sir. cause analysis. Govin, can you type that in the chat box? R-C-A. Romeo, Charlie, Africa. Root cause analysis. So Miss Amal can remember it and go back and study it before our next lecture when I'm going to test her again. All right, Amal? Yes, sir. Good girl. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Let's talk to the next student. Uh, Denise. Hello, Denise. How are you today, mate? Unmute your microphone, please. Hi, mate. Hi. Good. Good, mate. How are you, Dennis? How can I help you today? Yeah. Yeah. Just only a small question. Yes. Go ahead. Between passive and procrastinate. Is it the same or what? Well, that's a very good question, mate. I was just about <laughs> to make the comparison. Well, let me share it with you. All right, let's talk All about right. it. Okay, ladies, don't get upset with me, but you are the best example of procrastination. And I use this example all the time. If Amal has forgotten this example, I'm really going to give her a hard time. Amal, ladies procrastinate every time they go to buy shoes, right? Yes, Amal? Okay. Ladies procrastinate every time they go to the hairdressing salon. Ladies procrastinate every time they're looking for a new husband or a new boyfriend. Ladies procrastinate every time the husband says, darling, let me take you out for dinner. Because you get in the car and you say, honey, should we eat Turkish, French, Japanese or Chinese? And you're halfway along the highway. She said, you know, hon, I don't feel like Chinese. I'm sick of Turkish. I ate Japanese yesterday. I'm sick of eating Western. What should we eat? So women procrastinate. Do you understand what I'm saying, Dennis? And procrastination, yeah, yeah. procrastination is the same as being passive. What is yeah. the similarity? Because somebody who's passive is not prepared to admit that they have a problem and they are not prepared to do okay. anything to solve the problem. They just, hi, Dennis, are you there? Can you hear me? Dennis? Yes, sir. Now it's okay. All right, can you repeat? Do you understand what I said? Did you hear what I said? Do you understand the reality? So if somebody is yeah, passive yeah. in your organization and they don't tell you about the problems they're facing with their customers because they're scared that you're going to question them or give them extra work, is that the same okay. as being passive and procrastinating? Yeah, it's almost the same because uh, it's always causing delay and it will affect everything. It's not almost, Dennis, it's not uh, almost the same. All, it is the same. Yeah, it all is. Right? It is, yeah. Are you yeah. married, Dennis? Yeah. All right. Can I ask married. you, is procrastination something you find happens at home every day? Uh, always. <laughs> and but can we, I, we arrange it. Okay. Tell me, how do you deal with it usually? Give me an example. No, no, Especially no, for... No personal information, just generically. How do you deal with it? Yeah, uh, regarding these things, uh, especially we have kids and they want to buy something. And I told always, uh, we'll just, if it is important, okay, we have to buy. But if we can delay it as much as possible, we will do it. Uh, can I ask you a question, Dennis? <laughs> I'm going to give you some hint because I'm a first time father. Uh, I only have one. So you're probably okay. more experienced. But if I procrastinate right. with my daughter, she'll remind me every day. So I've learned that I have to explain why. Daddy will buy it for you at the end of the month or when you're old enough to have it. Do you do that? Yep. Okay. And you Always. Know what? And you know what I find, uh -huh. Dennis? She'll come back uh -huh. to me after a week and say, Daddy, I'm one week <laughs> older today. Am I ready to buy it? And I have to say, no, you need to wait another two weeks. But Dennis, that's the, that's the fun of being a father. God bless yeah. you. How many exactly, children do yeah. you have, mate? How many children? Yeah, I have two. Is one number girl three and one coming? Boy. Number three coming? I uh, know. <laughs> how We're old just, are you? Uh, yeah, I'm 46. No, how old are your children, mate? Uh, children, yeah. Oh, it's six, uh, 13 and seven. 
Well, Sorry. mine is only six years old, so you're a lot more experienced than me. I might ask <laughs> you for help. But have I answered yeah. your question today? Did I answer your mm -hmm. question? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Right. That's, Good. that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, let me go on. Thank let you. me talk to Abdul Rahouf Hans, Has, Hasanya. Hello, Abdul Rahouf. How are you today? Unmute your microphone, mate. Hi, Abdul Rahouf. How are you? Um, hello, I'm okay. Ah, good. God bless you. How are you today? How have you enjoyed today's lecture? Um, it was amazing. It was nice. Yeah. Okay. I tell, me, many things. tell me what questions you have that you want to ask so I can clarify anything that I've explained. Um, okay. Uh, I have a question whether C-suite or C-level are the same or not. Matt, uh, actually, or well, they're I, just... Uh, yeah. No, they're, they're just words. That no, they're, 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 they're the same meaning. It's just that some people call them C-suite. Some people call them C-level. I'll give you an example. If you go to a major organization like one of the world's biggest airlines, Air France, KLM, they call it C-suite because that's the common interpretation in that part of the world. If you go to the United States, um, Australia, the UK, we call it sea level, all right? But sea level refers to usually anybody part of the management team or executive team, all right? Now, let me just tell you, uh, Abdul Rauf, if you go to work for somebody like Microsoft, everybody from senior manager all the way up to executive price president are called C-suite, all right? But if I go to a so small supermarket chain in your country, C-suite might only be the general manager, the chief financial officer, the chief marketing officer, the chief technology officer, all right? So depending on how big the company structure is, the C-suite will grow. But how do you define the C-suite? It's the people that carry the responsibilities of C-level, which I explained to you before. Does that help you? Yeah, thank you. Okay, can I ask you, are you already at sea level? Are you working at the moment? No, I'm not working. I'm just a student. You're just a student. Well, let me tell you, Abdul Rauf, I'm going to give you some ambition to work towards. I graduated from university after cleaning toilets at McDonald's, as you should all know from my past history. I ran away from home at 18 and I found a job at McDonald's in Sydney, New South Wales at Bondi Beach, or Bondi Junction, sorry, cleaning toilets. I was a toilet cleaner for three days and I had the shock of my life because my parents were millionaires and I never cleaned a toilet in my life. But I had a choice. Did I want to study and become successful or did I want, do I want to walk the streets? Anyway, I worked my way through university and I graduated. I was told by my franchisee, the store owner, that on the day I graduate, he would fire me. But that never really sunk in until he attended my graduation and took me out for dinner with his lovely wife because I didn't talk to my parents at that stage for three years. And at the end of the day, he said, Wally, you know, you're like my second son. I'm so proud of you. You've graduated. This is yours. Guess what I found in the envelope? I found a termination letter from McDonald's. Do you know how hurt I was? But he left me with three words of advice, Abdul Rauf. Go out there and find a C-level job that you deserve. You spent three years at university. You graduated as a valedictorian. You don't want to earn $3,000 a month as a store manager. Rauf, I went out on a Friday night. I went back to my student dormitory. I submitted 224 applications online by Monday. On Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, I got a phone call from a multinational insurance company in Melbourne. I was told that they wanted to interview me at four o'clock that day. I packed my bag. I spent $300 on a business class ticket, which I would never have spent because economy was full. I flew from Sydney to Melbourne wearing my old gray suit to go to an interview. The next day of the Rauf, I got my first C-level job as assistant vice president. All right. And three months later, I got promoted to senior vice president. My starting salary in my first job was in excess of 12,000 Australian dollars a month. All right. But what I'm saying, Abdul Rauf, is I want you to go out there with a level of confidence. You should be aiming to graduate and not just get a job.
you should be aiming to be able to say to any employer, I understand what it means to be a leader today. I'm looking for a leadership role. I know that I knew I'm a fresh graduate, but I bring the I bring fresh blood. I bring the latest leadership skills, and I would be able to bring new ideas, and I would be able to fit in with your company culture. Do you understand where I'm coming from, Abdurraouf? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It was uh, motivational. Yeah. No, and uh, you, I look forward to seeing you at our next session. Thank you very much for joining me today. Good afternoon, Thank sir. You. Thank you. I can, I can talk to two more people. Um, let's talk to um, Yakubu uh, Ihojo. Monday. Hello, Yakubu. Would you like to open your microphone, please? Are you there, Yakubu? Uh, Yakubu has. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Hello. Yakubu. Hi. How can I help you, sir? Go ahead. I I want to say, from the class today, I have learned that not to just the leaders uh, are people that solve issues, that solve that that solve. They go beyond solving solutions. That as a leader. Managers are solving, but leaders go beyond. So I've learned that as a person, I should always go beyond solving the 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 the, the issue or the problem. But you've Secondly, learned you've learned, you've learned you've learned you've you've learned one of the most important gists of 21st century leadership. So you have learned something from my lesson today. Very good. Go ahead. Secondly, yes. my question is: I I want to ask. Uh... Go ahead. My question is um, my question is uh, CIO and CTO. Now I want to quickly say that, like uh, in the country where I come from, so like some uh, companies, uh, I want to ask: uh, Can 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 they employ one person for those position? Can one person be employed for, for that position, or maybe two different? Because there are some companies that they employ just one person for to be a, a, an a CIO and a CTO. That one person. So I want to ask: Can what is it is is it applicable? Can one person be employed for that two position? Oh, well, okay. Well, let me just explain. Key man positions, as they're called, which are critical positions in an organization, there is always one CEO, unless you're a multi-billion dollar company, like, um, you know, the World Bank, which have CEOs in each country, and then they have an a, a international CEO. Um, and all the country CEOs report to the chief executive officer internationally. All right. So that is possible for an international company with offices all over the world. It's globalized, all right? Um, but it, on an average basic company, usually there's only one CEO, one CIO, one CTO, but some companies can't afford that. So it is quite common for small, medium enterprise to have one person share two responsibilities. Is it effective? No, it's not. Because if he's a CEO, he doesn't know what to do as a CIO or CTO. But unfortunately, some companies can't afford to have both. Is it effective? No, it's not. Um, the ideal answer to that is the CEO is a CEO and the technical or the information should be left to a CIO or CTO, but they should not be carried out by the same person. Um, you know, especially if the CEO doesn't have any technology background, then he could be causing more damage than good for the company. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. You're yes. welcome, sir. It's my pleasure. Anytime. Thank Ladies you. and welcome. gentlemen, once again, for those of you who don't know my name, my name is Wally Rauder. I have been an academic for 38 plus years. I'm a fellow um, at many universities around the world. I have been a expert or a HR human resources management expert. Um, I have lectured in strategic management, strategic marketing and leadership and supervisory skills for the last 30 years. I am a motivator to companies and a motivator to governments. Um, and I have been for some 28 years. What I've shared with you today are the basic elements that I see from my perspective as critical factors in being a leader in the 21st century. Does everybody understand that? Now, 
you might talk to other academics who will say there's other elements. There is. And I could present for another three hours, but I don't want to do that. What I want to leave you with is the basic, most fundamental requirements for being an effective leader in the 21st century. Does everybody understand what I said here today? All right. What I will do for all of you is when you get your certificate by email next week, I will make sure that the PDF version of today's PowerPoint is attached, okay? Um, because I haven't shared with you here today. So I'll make sure that my clerk sends it to you all by email for this leadership session only. You will all receive it by email um, when you receive your certificate. Is everybody happy with that? Can you all wave your hands to me if you're happy with that? All right. I do remind you that um, leadership series will be back, not next week, but the following week. So I look forward to seeing you again at the leadership series the week after next. On my behalf, Wally Rauder and my senior, Mr. Benson Ma, who usually presents the leadership series, we wish you all happy studies. Keep on studying and remember, your dream will come true. Your learning journey never stops. Keep pushing yourself to continue learning.